So I'm, our next speaker then is Dr. Albertini, who has been in, grew up in the Boston area, was at Harvard, on Harvard, went to graduate school at Harvard, and then stayed on the Harvard faculty for a little while, and then was recruited to Tufts Medical Center for a number of years, where he served as chair of anatomy and cell biology for a while. And then he was recruited to Kansas. Must be a little bit like being recruited to Texas, right? <laughs> They offered him a, a deal that he couldn't pass, couldn't pass by. It was a really good situation for a little while. Um, and then he decided to come back to the East Coast. He was there for six years, five years in Kansas? Ten years. Ten years in Kansas. Um, 30 years at Tufts, I think. Um, and now he is back on the East Coast. He's been in New York for a while, at, at um, working with the, the, a really good A group there, um, a Glacier's group. And now he's actually joined us as a senior consulting scientist at the, at the Baker Research Foundation on our own egg work. And we are absolutely thrilled to have David's expertise. And so he's going to introduce to this group today some of the basic biology of this enormous cell that we all came from. Um, David. Thank you, Ann. It's a pleasure to be back in the neighborhood. And as Ann said, uh, the, let's see, the, uh, you know, really, this is finally the manifestation of all those years that those of us who were very interested in reproductive biology started over 20 years ago. And it's uh, really, I think, a wonderful occasion for all of us to try and bring together the importance of the biology, the oocyte, uh, and circadian rhythms. Um, so, what what eggs have to do with what we're timing, what we're talking about today, uh, is all about timing. And I and I think as you brought up with regard to the LH search, okay, we you know, we've understood the importance of the SCN and the rest of the reproductive axis in terms of the timing of reproductive cycles. Okay, but how this, how we bring this down to the level of, in the case of ants interest, how these clock genes may be working within the embryo, but getting there in the first place is very much a reflection of the rhythms that drive ovarian physiology. That is the events that take place in the ovary that have to be integrated, as you will see, not only across the organ, through the HPG axis, for example, but even within the ovary. And really, I'd like to just give you a sense for how our knowledge of the development of the oocyte within the ovary has occurred. And I'm going to focus on something that you brought up, uh, which is what is the consequence of the LH surge at the time of ovulation? Because this final phase of oogenesis, you will see, represents what we refer to as the final maturation, and it's during that interval of time, which is different across species, but in the human, it's about 40 to 46 hours following the LH surge. It's in that interval of time that the oocyte is prepared for fertilization and early development. And I would submit to you, compared to where we were 30 years ago, in thinking about how much information does the egg or oocyte carry into embryogenesis, we 30 years ago thought a frog is a frog, a fly is a fly, a worm is a worm, a fish is a fish, because these things all have these maternal resources, like yolk, okay? And we thought, oh, the mammalian egg has no yolk. So therefore, most of what must be driving early development prior to implantation would have been due to zygotic gene activation. In other words, we often thought of the mammalian embryo as having a regulative form of development versus what we know our model systems have, which is something that's more determinant. And I'm going to challenge that hypothesis today because I think while the yolk may not take the same form, the resources to build a mammalian embryo up through the time of implantation are probably a reflection of the maternal legacy. That's a punchline, okay? So the components of this pathway, in terms of building today, do have very much to do with maternal health, lifestyle, etc. And the years of 
human ARTs now, treating infertility, have reinforced this over and over again. Studies now on the impact of diet, on the impact of obesity, on the ovaries' ability to respond, and the quality of the eggs and the quality of the embryos that come from individuals that may have had different environmental exposures, we know has a profound impact, not only on the, the physiology of the ovary, but on the quality of the egg and the quality of the embryos that arise in that circumstance. So, let's just ask the sort of very broad question, you know, what is it, what is it that sets the stage for development in terms of egg production? When do you make eggs? When do you ovulate? And what are the qualities that are ascribed to this cell that would allow it, in response to fertilization, to carry out all of the steps of development? And what, we, what we've come to appreciate for years now is that the reproductive lifespan in most organisms is restricted to a finite segment of the overall lifespan. Okay? And there's much debate these days on if we can extend our overall lifespan, does that mean that it would be coupled to extension of the reproductive lifespan in these organisms? Okay, It's not known, but it's a question that's being asked. Um, we know certainly if we confine our comments to mammals that as mammals age, there is a reduction in their fecundity. There is a reduction in their fecundity with advancing age. And this has to do with both a quantitative and a qualitative measure of reproductive performance. The qualitative measure is that we know that the eggs that are retrieved from older animals or older <coughs> women do not have the same developmental potential as those that are taken from younger women. In addition, in species <coughs> like our own, or monovular species, we know that there is a gradual reduction in the number of eggs contained within follicles within the ovary. So there's a there's a quantitative uh, there's a quantitative impact on our ability to reproduce, which is playing out in society today. Couples are waiting longer and longer to raise their families, and so by the time they come to see us in the clinic, they're they're already pushing their odds for actually ever being able to produce a good egg. Okay, so this is very relevant to what's going on today. Of course. Clocks play into the endocrine system, and again, the regulation will confine our comments to ovulation itself today. And one of the remarkable things that distinguishes our species from some others is that follicles that are selected within a driven reproductive cycle, each containing an egg that has the potential to be ovulated and contribute to the formation of an embryo. These follicles of which only one will be selected for ovulation. In, in, in our case, since we're a monovular species, there is a strong selective pressure for choosing the correct follicle that will provide that egg for fertilization. Okay. So, a few of the messages I'd like to leave with you today. First of all, building an egg through the process called oogenesis, is a very complicated process, okay? And so we'll take a look at some of the temporal and spatial features of what go into building an egg. And the first and extremely important point to remember is that the oocyte itself is a reflection of the physiology of the ovary within which it develops. And in particular, Oocytes develop within structures called follicles, and it's within the confines of the follicle that all of the important patterns in gene expression, epigenetic modifications, and competencies that will allow that egg to finish the meiotic cell cycle and initiate fertilization, these all take place within this niche, if you will, of the follicle, which we'll spend some time discussing. They're inseparable processes in many ways. And they are, by the way, the integration of oogenesis with follicular genesis is absolutely required for controlling reproduction in terms of feedback mechanisms that go back in the brain, as you'll see. Uh, and while our knowledge of 
how the, the hypothalamus pituitary and venatal axis is integrated, while our knowledge 25 years ago was founded primarily on evidence having to do with gonadotropin hormones, actions of the ovary, and the outputs of steroids from the ovary. We now know that there's another whole layer of really important paracrine signaling mechanisms that mediate the communication of the oocyte with the soma. And we have a much better knowledge now of how that happens. And as I mentioned, I'm going to focus today on what is referred to as the maturation phase of oogenesis. So what does this process look like? Hey, we are born, women are born with a set of these primordial follicles, which remain quiescent until the organism reaches sexual maturity, begins to cycle. So these peripubital changes result in the first step being that there is activation of these so-called resting primordial follicles. The follicle then goes through a growth phase. There is both proliferation uh, and differentiation of the somatic cells surrounding the oocyte. And within this stage, which is generally regarded as being a gonadotropin independent phase, in other words, you can, you can disrupt the axis, you can destroy the hypothalamus, you can remove the pituitary, you can knock out these hormones, and in the absence of that hormonal influence, this process will proceed up to this point. So it's referred to as the gonadotropin independent growth phase of oogenesis. Once the follicle reaches this stage of development, it is committed to either being ovulated or degenerated, the process known as atresia, this place back the selection process I mentioned. And essentially what happens is this oocyte has been arrested in meiotic prophase since, in humans, since the time of birth, actually even before, the meiotic cell cycle stops in prophase of meiosis one. So the cell cycle of the oocyte during this journey is arrested. And it's arrested in the equivalent of an M phase of the cell cycle. It is not until the LH surge, which will trigger a number of interesting molecular changes in the target cells of the follicle, that the oocyte is informed to now begin the process of what we call meiotic maturation, which is a process whereby the chromosomal composition of the female germ cell will go through two rounds of meiotic reduction to produce a haploid gamete. I'm going to show you in a minute what this looks like. Okay? So this final phase of maturation in the oocyte is triggered by the LH surge and involves not only the reactivation of the cell cycle, but as you'll see, reactivation, progression into metaphase of meiosis II, and then arrest again. This is critical to the fertilizability of the egg. And it spends a finite amount of time in a state where it is responsive to fertilization. OK, so this map, as I mentioned, is driven not only by gonadotropin-dependent and independent stages, but by a series of really well-established paracrine feedback control mechanisms. So the follicle, the basic players over here, this would be a portion of an oocyte. The pink line is the zona pellucida, which is a specialized extracellular coat that wraps the oocyte and separates it from these somatic cells inside the ovarian follicle. And what we've come to understand over the last 20 years is that, oh, and I should also mention there's a basement membrane here. And outside the follicle is another layer of somatic cells called the theca cells. These three cell types, theca cells, which are steroidogenic, the granulosa cells, which support the oocyte's growth and maturation, as we'll see, and the oocyte itself, 
manifests an elaborate feedback system that's based primarily on the actions of TGF beta family members. Some of these are oocyte specific, <clears throat> ones that we worked on back when I was here at Tufts, included GDF9 and BMP15. These are two members of the TGF beta super family. They're made exclusively in the oocyte, and it is their responsibility to target these granulosis cells, which will essentially take over control of the metabolism of the egg and prepare the oocyte's metabolism for the energetic needs of the embryo after fertilization. This is another thing that, uh, that we're, we're really struggling with a bit in the world of mammalian reproductive physiology. Again, the autonomy of the egg, once it is fertilized, seems to have been established during this process of development in the ovary. Okay. And there are, there are good reasons for believing that that we can discuss later. So really, the production the production line here is really a continuous one. It's a developmental continuum. It starts with these little follicles that contain the so-called primordial oocytes that are waiting to be activated. It will be manifest at the time of ovulation with the release of the oocyte in a mature state that will be sufficient in the event of fertilization to support all of the morphogenetic events that we typically associate with pre-implantation mammalian development. So, uh, there's another feature of this feedback system, uh, in, including the fact that there, there is evidence, as was mentioned, that the target cells in the ovary that are expressing various of the circadian rhythm genes, okay, are located in these granulosa cells. And these are the cells that immediately surround the oocyte, as you're going to see momentarily, they are the metabolic support system for the development and maturation of the oocyte. But more importantly, these yellow spots, greenish spots, represent the expression of gap junction proteins, which essentially confer on this structure the properties of a syncytium not unlike those of the myocardium in the heart, not unlike those in the muscularis layers that we see in various tubular organs that coordinate peristalsis. And I think we often lose sight of the fact that the integration, the physiological integration of these cell types is absolutely tantamount for the metabolic support that the oocyte will receive. So, what does an ovary look like? <laughs> okay, this is, uh, it's actually a, a, a home of a chimpanzee monkey. Here's a follicle that is maybe getting close to ovulating. Here are some of those growing follicles. And for those of you up front, you may be able to see many small spots out here in the cortex. So, so the ovary is essentially a reservoir of all of these potential follicles and potential oocytes, the vast majority of which will never get to the point of ovulating. Uh, and we'll come back to this because there have been some advances recently in the field of fertility preservation, where for patients whose ovaries are about to be damaged by radiotherapy or chemotherapy, we're now in a position to strip these follicles off and grow them to a point that we can obtain oocytes that could be used to treat a patient that would have gone through this therapy and lost their functional ovary. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Now, the grand unifying hypothesis here <laughs> that is bringing us together as both circadian rhythm <coughs> biologist and egg biologist I think has been best summarized in this paper by Craig Atwood at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. It's a review article in which he would he proffers the idea that the regulation of ovarian function is inextricably tied to the timing of early development, but also preparations in the reproductive tract that would ensure the successful implantation of that embryo and the establishment of a stable pregnancy. So 
So this again, when we think about the central pathway versus peripheral clocks in organs, okay, his paper, you know, suggests that we need to be thinking about not only an ovarian clock, but a fallopian tube clock, a uterine clock, okay, and for the Evo Devo fanatics amongst you, there's even good evidence that the liver historically had to be integrated into reproductive cyclicity, mainly because yolk proteins are under estrogen control in the liver. And there are probably vestiges of that even in mammalian reproduction, although they remain pretty unclear. So just to, just to again, walk through a couple of steps, um, getting from a primordial follicle to here, we now have identified, most of this work derives from mouse knockout studies that have identified specific, uh, the impact of specific <coughs> gene deletions with the stages of follicular development. And I'm not going to go through them, but there are many, many factors that act sequentially along the pathway. And if you really wanted to take a hardcore look at the complexity of this just within the ovary, then we have to deal with uh, you know, these various lists of both paracrine factors, steroids, a number of other things that all, again, are a consequence of the brain signaling through the hypothalamus and pituitary signaling through the action of gonadotropins and then these compartments of the ovary responding to those signaling events and affecting the various stages of development, okay? So I'd like to just pause for a moment. I don't know if we can turn the lights down a little bit. I wanted to show you a movie of what this looks like. This is a mouse oocyte. It's a movie we made some years ago. And this is what maturation looks like. So here's a single oocyte. That's the nucleus, or germinal vesicle. This is the zone of pellucida layer. Uh, and this is, a, this is a G2M cell cycle transition. So the nuclear envelope is just broken down. The bivalents uh, of meiosis are now condensing. And they're going to align on this structure, which is a, a meiotic spindle. It's a microtubule-rich structure. And uh, some of you may have noticed that when we started this sequence, the nucleus was actually attached to the <coughs> membrane here. And I'm going to come back to that just as an inference with regard to the spatial organization of this process. So the chromosomes are now aligning in anaphase of meiosis one. This domain is the spindle. The next thing you're going to see is that the spindle will now begin to migrate back to the original point of attachment of the nucleus. I'm going to just let you enjoy that for a minute. You can see these forces uh, tugging not only along the chromosomes themselves with respect to microtubules being captured and pushed and pulled, but also the whole spindle is now moving back towards the cortex. And when it makes contact with the membrane, the What's the timing? So this is a mouse oocyte. So what you're looking at is over a 10-hour period. I'm going to review that in a minute, OK? And then, just like the textbooks told us years ago, the first polar body actually cleaves into two. Okay? Rarely do you actually see that in a human oocyte that goes through this process. And then the cell cycles are rested again. Here are the chromosomes aligned on the second metaphase spindle. And now we're ready to be fertilized. Okay. Thank you. So, the time, as Anne just asked. Okay, that was a mouse oocyte. And here is where the LH surge would have taken place and initiated ovulation in that follicle. And essentially, it takes 12 to 14 hours in a rodent oocyte to uh, get to the point that we just saw. Metaphase of meiosis 2. And we can ask, how stable is this cell cycle state? And it turns out that in, mam in mammalian oocytes, there's a finite period of time that that state is stabilized, during which normal fertilization can occur. So the spindle, for example, will begin to deteriorate and disappear over this kind of a time course. In the bovine, which is an elegant model that we've uh, been able to use over the years to study this process, there's a slight delay. 
Okay? Again, a window of stability is finite. Again, it's a matter of six to eight hours, okay? And the same in the human, although the process is a little delayed, the same thing happens. This, to me, argues for some kind of a clock was set in this cell, okay? And to my knowledge, while there's been some work done in granulosa cells, I don't know that we have really carefully looked at this within the germ cell itself, but obviously it may play into the message profiles that you're detecting in the embryos later on. Are these, in fact, inherited from mom? Are these messenger RNAs that are produced by the zygote, or are they there? And is this the very beginning of a developmental clock that we're trying to understand? And, and we know along the way what some of the factors are, for example, that determine this period of time that the oocytes become, uh, that the oocyte is stable and ready to be fertilized, uh, but, but really have not been able to put this into a context that would be relevant to a clinical problem we see all the time, which is that the human oocytes we retrieve, or patients being treated for infertility, we don't know where we stand in this clock. Some of them age prematurely. We'd like to be able to stabilize them, but it's a bit of a mystery. So how does this information get into the oocyte? We have an LH surge on the one hand, and now we have this incredible cell cycle progression, very carefully timed, the onset of the kinetics, and then the clock before it deteriorates. How is this communicated, essentially, from the brain to finally the germ cell. And it turns out that there is a very elaborate interface between those granulosa cells and the surface of the oocyte. There are structures that are responsible for delivering many of the metabolites that are critical for early development. ATP. The oocyte does not have the ability to generate ATP on its own. It's mitochondria are quiescent. It's been known for years. Okay? So where will the energy come to drive development? It come from these somatic cells. Part of the response to LH is to engage the metabolism of those somatic cells. They increase ATP synthesis. It is transported, much like a neuronal projection, down to the surface of the oocyte. And, the, and we, we have, over the years, referred to this as metabolic coding. <coughs> So the metabolites that are needed to drive early embryogenesis are in fact product of the soma, and they're transported into the egg. A critical one is glutathione, the GSH. To form the male pronucleus, that is to decondense the sperm chromatin and form a functional pronucleus, requires the reduction of proteins on the sperm DNA, okay? And the glutathione, which is absolutely required for formation of the male pronucleus, comes from when? Comes from the metabolism of the manulosa cell. Very clear now, molecular genetic terms. People have looked at gene expression profiles. It, the oocyte could not have made the millimolar levels of glutathione that we know exist in the early embryo. So this is a, a remarkable process. It's just, if you don't believe it, it's something that's been worked out over the years, and it's, it reminds me a little bit of the organization of the cerebellum when I begin to look at these multi-branch connections, okay? This is an extensively integrated system that is directing all of the signaling that's going to be required to prepare this oocyte for ovulation and fertilization later on, okay? So, just in, in closing, you know, if we wanted to really begin to think about, you know, what are the legacies that mom and dad bring to the party of fertilization is the way I like to think of it, okay? Um, well, two genomes, okay? Two genomes, one from mom, one from dad. Good enough, okay? Mitochondrial genomes, we understand, are maternally inherited, okay? Although, as some of you may know, this past year, this is the first report in science of male mitochondrial genomes appearing in living humans, okay? So, you know, that part of the exclusivity of maternal inheritance through the female side from mitochondrial DNA is being looked at as a possible source of disease risk later in life, 
actually. Okay. Um, pretty much all of the organelles that the embryo will inherit came from love. Okay. Uh, it's more than mitochondria. Okay. We do know that sperm contribute a centrosome, which is an important organizing element for the early cell divisions of the embryo. Okay. And a very important, and I think uh, will be very relevant uh, uh, process that's now been identified in uh, not only rodent eggs and uh, cow eggs, but also in humans, is something that Jerry and Dean at the NIH discovered about 10 years ago now. It's called the subcortical maternal complex. This is a cytoskeletal assembly that forms during oocyte maturation that binds many of the maternal RNAs that will be translated at later stages of development, specifically at the time of compaction. Okay? And, uh, and, and I think, again, this is sort of a dimension of what's going into building the egg that we're, that we're finally coming to fully understand. So it's going to be a complicated thing to sort this out. But at the end of the day, you know, we're in the middle of, I think that some of you may have heard, seven million babies are now been produced by assisted reproductive technologies worldwide, okay? And we're still struggling to improve the efficiency of this. The answers are going to be, many of us think, within the biology of the oocyte itself. Uh, certainly this will play into the Carpenter Genetic Stem Cell Project that Ann is directing. And I think it's, you know, we're going to have to look more closely at the relationship of these clock genes, et cetera, within this larger framework. That was a plug for you, Ann. Okay? <laughs> and I'm going to end here. Uh, building a competent, a developmentally competent oocyte, one that can actually carry out the responsibilities, if you will, of a pre-implantation animal, uh, pre-implantation embryo. This requires somatic maternal inputs that are manifest at several levels in the axis. Okay? So we have some preliminary indications where the central versus peripheral clocks may be integrated, but really very rudimentary. As a peripheral clock, the identity of circadian rhythm mechanisms has yet to be defined, although I think it's becoming clear that the ovary and perhaps certain cells in this follicular compartment are obvious places for us to look, okay? But I think, uh, you know, in the end, I wouldn't be surprised if there's something going on in the oocyte that helps to synchronize these feedback mechanisms. So I'm going to stop there, and thank you, and I'd be happy to take questions.
editing, and obviously you can add a little bit of uh, complexity to the kinds of things you're trying to work on.